Alright, welcome back everyone. This is the Happy Toolbox and this week I'm going to be showing you how to generate this completely procedural paint stroke you see here. Uh, this is completely changeable to whatever you want it to look like, uh, whatever path you want it to follow. Sky's the limit on this thing and it's completely non-destructive. I'd sent my buddy a photo of this a while ago and said I wonder if we can create something like this in Cinema 4D and he came through and figured out a system. So I'm going to show you what he came up with here. I'm going to throw his Instagram handle down the left hand corner. Go ahead and give him a follow. And if you're interested in this tutorial, let's get going. Okay, so if I take a look at some reference material here, you can see what we're going to try and achieve is um, a lot of paint on one side being pulled across the page and kind of diminishing as it comes to the end and having there be broken up parts. There are, you know, some streaks from the bristles, but you can see they're broken up and not completely even. And so to do that, we're going to first and foremost create two planes. So one, two. First one, let's call it paper. And the second one we will call paint. So I'm just gonna hide our paper plane for now. And then on our paint plane, I'm going to make it 50 by 200. So now we have this nice little rectangle going on here. And then I am also going to want to generate a null and then stack that paint plane under it. Um, and we'll be stacking a displacement object in here in a little bit. Uh, so that's why we're generating that null. Let's go ahead and turn our paper back on. And let's just add a couple uh, rough materials here, just default materials. So white for the paper, and then another one, let's say bluish color. Let's throw that on the paint material. So that way we can see what's going on here a little bit better. And then displacement is, based upon segments. So if I go to my paint object, we're going to want to up the width segments and height segments quite a bit. So I'm going to go from 10 on each of these to about 100. So if I go to garage shading with lines, you can see I've added quite a bit of uh, polys to this thing. So that's looking good. And then let's go ahead and grab a displacement object. So if I go over here, Going to go down to displacer and stack that into my null. Now displacement is driven by black and white values. So if I go into our displacer and into the shading tab and go into shader, um, if I just add a gradient in here and switch that gradient to 2D V, you can kind of see what's going on here if I turn off the paper. So from the side, you can see that the white value is, I believe, higher. Yeah, so the white value is higher. The black value is getting a negative uh, pushdown value. So you can see that if I turn our paper on, uh, anything that's white in this displacement shader uh, is higher than the paper. Anything that's black is lower, and then obviously gray values in between. So one note here, how I generally like to work or how my buddy showed me how he works, um, he likes to go to uh, the type and object of displacer. And basically intensity centered means uh, black is a negative value, gets pushed down, white gets pushed up as I said, but if you change it to uh, intensity, black is now the floor value. So it's not gonna go lower than the floor but white will still bring it up. And so this is just an easier way to view this. Um, you don't get as uh, intense extremes where the black is like shooting way down um, farther than you want. Like if I bring this height up, you know, there's like a base point at which this, this gradient is working, which I like a lot. I'm going to go back to my gradient and just as our reference imagery has kind of thicker paint on one side, it tapers off at the end. We kind of want to make that shape here. So I'm going to pull this white over a little bit, add another little notch and make that completely black so we get falling off back to the floor. And then I'm going to move this white point over farther um, and then pull this center point maybe a little over. So that way we get kind of this nice uh, rise from the floor 
Um, and in theory, this is kind of our thick paint side uh, tapering down and losing paint as we go. And then if I go back to our shader, just like in Photoshop, um, you can add layers. So I'm going to drop this little carrot down and go down to layer. And what that's going to do is that's going to immediately stack that gradient I generated inside of a layer tree. And you can see here, I can add different things on top of that uh, and mix and match using uh, different blending modes. And with this, what I want to do is I want to go to shader. I want to add another gradient. And I'm going to affect the sides now of this paint stroke. So I'm going to leave it as is. Put a point here, make that white. Pull the white over again, put another point, make that black. So I'm kind of making this little uh, rectangular shape. I pull these over a little bit more. And if I go up another level, you can see I have these two gradients stacked on top of each other, and we only see that new gradient uh, displacing this object currently. So I want to change the blend mode to multiply. And once I do that, you basically get those two gradients blended together, and they're both affecting the displacement of this object jointly. Now from here, I want to basically turn all this off so we can just focus on the noise that will create the brush stroke itself. Uh, as you can see in our reference again, uh, there's all of these nice strokes, but they are kind of broken up. There's some almost noise happening on the ends of these as the paint runs out. So I'm going to turn off just the paper for now. I'm going to turn off these two gradients, go back to our base layer, but I'm still going to stay in this layer tree. I'm just going to add a new shader and I'm going to add some noise. And so immediately when I add the noise, again, black and white values in a displacer object affect geometry like this. You can see it kind of pushes and pulls uh, this geometry up and down. Um, and what we found works pretty well is uh, in relative scale, just bump this up to like 2,500. And so immediately you get kind of these long fat streaks going on. And then if you bring it in a little bit, you can start to see more of those stripes happening. So let's say, I don't know, 48. Um, but this is very uniform. It almost looks like ribbed uh, sheet metal going on here. Uh, you know, there's a, little, there's a little differences going on here, but what we really want is we want this to be broken up in the same way that a lot of, you know, these back particles are uh, being broken up, or you can see some of the streaks go in and out and disappear. And so if you go over to noise, and instead this carrot that shows you the text, a little tip, if you hit this little weird UI carrot that no one can find, um, let me pull the screen in here to my screen recording. You can see there is a visualizer of the different noise types, which is really handy, because uh, no one knows what those names mean. Um, the best noise that we found works for this is Naki. So I'm going to select Naki. You can see right away I'm getting a bunch more uh, broken up bumps. It just immediately made the surface more rough. I think I'm going to bump this back up to 100% so you can really see uh, how the strokes are varying now. Um, and then what's great about this again uh, in the seed, you can just constantly change the look of this. So again, that's the procedural part of this whole setup, which is really nice if you want to make a bunch of different styled brush strokes. And then to add even more detail to this, um, I'm going to go to my paint and add a little more geometry. So from 100, I'm going to go to 400. So it's going to get a little more chunky from this point. Um, if you have a good machine, it should stand up. This is just so we can see what's going on, help with our direction. You can always knock these down as you work or stack it um, under a subdivision surface potentially. Um, but I'm going to pump it up to 400. I'm going to go back into my noise um, and I'm also going to pump the octaves up. So you can see octaves are at five right now. I'm going to jump it up to about 20 um, and that just adds just a little bit more noise in here. Kind of like that other seed we were on. Where was that? See, this one's pretty cool. Let's stick with this one. And then I'm going to go up in my stack of shaders I've created. 
Um, I want, again, to mix all of these gradients and noise together, so I'm going to change it to multiply. Obviously, I have these other gradients off. Let's just turn noise off to see what's happening. So first, we added you know, this linear gradient that is ramping it up. We then multiplied another gradient on top of it to bring the sides down. And now if we turn our noise on, we basically are taking that ramp shape and applying this really cool streaked noise through the whole object. Um, but it's going up this ramp and tapering down and falling off at the end, which is super nice. Now, if I turn my paper back on and I kind of pull my paper up in Y, you can see we're already starting to get the shape of this that we want. And again, we're leveraging kind of the position of this geometry and points uh, through this paper to make this function and look like it's really stuck on a background. From here, uh, what we're missing is um, all of these little broken up pieces on the back of the trail, which I really like. So let's try and get those in there. Uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to our displacer, gonna go back to our shading stack. Um, and right now, uh, you know, this noise layer is on top of these two gradient ramps. What we wanna do is we want to add another noise shader. Let's just turn off this one for now so we can see what's going on. We wanna add another noise shader, but this time stack it in between the two gradients. And this way we can only affect that gradient ramp going down and not mess with the sides that much. Um, and then instead of normal, let's change it to add. So you can see the blacks um, are going to basically fall away and the whites will be added to this more so in the black zone that you can see down here. Um, and we're starting to get some noise only in the lower half of this. So if I go in here, I'm going to once again change the noise to Naki. I'm going to change the octaves up to 20 again. I'm going to then go to global scale, which is at 100. This is just too big. We want that little fine noise. So I'm going to pop this down to about 20. So now you get these really extreme kind of mountains going on. And the way you control this from here, um, you know, maybe instinct is to go and mess with the black values or something like that. But if you go back up a level in your stack, that's where these sliders on the side come in handy. So I can then pull this down. And basically only add about 15% of this noise in here and get kind of these broken up back ends. And then I'm gonna turn my top noise back on and I'm getting some of those little particulate streaks. So again, mess with this. Again, fully procedural, which is the best part of this setup. Still don't love uh, how tight the streaks are here on my paint. So I might go back into my noise, maybe actually push these out a little bit, maybe to 115%. Then I'm gonna mess with, ooh, that one was looking nice. Kinda like that one. No, there's like a weird hump in the middle. I feel like that's not really generally how paint works. That one's nice. I think I'll stick with that. I don't really like how far these kind of particles are eking into um, my stroke. And then you can also see at the front here what's supposed to be more of the smoothest section. Uh, I have a little pockmark going as well. So that is really easy to control with this setup as well. And the way you do that um, and kind of isolate different pieces and parts of this is you use folders. So I'm going to generate a folder. I'm gonna go ahead and turn off everything but that uh, noise layer. Put it inside of the folder. You can immediately see it right away. And then I'm going to create another gradient. And that kind of overtook the noise as you can see. So we want to uh, turn that gradient to multiply. 
And then if we go in the gradient, we want to switch this to 2dv. Now you can see uh, that noise is only affecting one area based upon this gradient. We obviously want it more towards the back, so I'm just going to switch these two colors. And now we can control completely how far uh, this noise goes into our brush stroke. So now if I go back up and I turn all of these on, oh, I have to make the folder a blend mode as well. So I'm going to make the folder add now. Now you can see the particles are still back here, but they're not traveling as far into the stroke. And then up here, we still have our nice uh, clean slopes going on. I think I'm actually going to make this a little bit harsher up at the front. So I'm going to go again to my base gradient, kind of pull this up a little bit. Again, that's the best part of this. You can basically play with this until you get it exactly how you want it. And you can also always go into the displacer, go back to the height, pump the height up even further so I can get an even more extreme look, which is great. Okay, so the piece we are now missing is obviously, let's say this is our look, we're happy with it, we've messed with you know, those gradients and noise patterns all day long. Um, we want to make curvature in our paint stroke. How we're going to do that is we are going to use a spline and a spline wrap. So I'm going to generate a spline and no one yell at me. I'm going to use a helix, uh, start radius down, end radius down, drop the points as low as they can go, turn the paper off so I can see what I'm doing. And I'm going to stamp that down. So now I have this straight spline that I use the helix to create. Everyone shut up. That's the way I do it, okay? Um, so I made that. And what's nice is the helix is about 200 centimeters tall, which is exactly what we put um, in the height of our paint stroke. I want to uh, center this spline now since it's off center starting from the side point. So if you hit shift C, you can bring up this little command window, um, type in axis center, grab that, hit execute. Now the axis is in the center of the spline and that way I can go into coordinates and zero this out. And now it will be dead center to our paint object. Uh, from there, I'm going to now use spline wrap. And I'm going to stack this spline wrap inside of our null object. And you can see immediately what the spline wrap does is it tries to conform to whatever geometry is inside of there. You can see this kind of fat arrow shape pointing this way. Um, it's thinking you want to wrap the spline and push it that direction, uh, which we don't want. So we want to go into object and go down to negative Z. Since this is the way uh, the paint stroke will be pulled, you know, our paintbrush starts over here, adds a big dollop down on the paper, and then we pull, and there becomes less and less paint as we pull. Um, and then we're going to take our helix and pull it into our spline. Now that we have this set up, if we move any points on this helix spline, so I'm going to go to points, select my helix spline, you can see we can actually start to inform and move this shape. Going to hide this really quick. Actually gonna delete these center points. And then add some intermediate points on our spline. Turn this back on. You can see there's a little bit of curvature going on and this is informing it. Uh, really nicely. And you can see our displacement is sticking to uh, this geometry as we move it. And one thing to note with that, uh, Cinema 4D works within order of operations. So as you can see, my displacement is sticking to this plane really nicely. But if you accidentally run into this, you know, if I put my spline wrap on top of this displacer and then move this, you can see now that 
displacement is kind of moving through the geometry. And that's because, again, order of operations. So you need to stack these um, accordingly. So from there, uh, basically you have this nice spline and you can uh, make it curve or rotate however you want um, to get the look you're looking for. So let's say we do something like this. Just basically taking these uh, handles, kind of curving them how I want. It's looking pretty good. You can add more points in here, obviously, to get uh, more extreme versions. I'm going to turn my paper back on, and you can see we're now getting a nice stroke look going on here. It's pretty cool. Kind of messing around, getting this stroke look. And that is looking pretty good. Now again, you can you know noodle with this all day to get exactly how you want it with those noise and gradient patterns. You know you can pull the paper up a little bit or down a little bit to get uh, way more broken up strokes, way less broken up strokes, etc. Um, again, I'm gonna leave it here. The last portion of this is obviously. You know, we want to be able to animate this and have it right on. And that's really easy. On the displacer, you just select it, go over to fields, and we're going to grab a box field. And as you can see, you just have to move this box field uh, through your displacement object, and it looks like it's writing on. So I might make, you know, this a little bit wider. So it's just making sure and getting everything. Maybe I'll make it a little thinner just for ease of use. But yeah, there you go. Animate that to your heart's content. And again, at any moment, go back into Displacer, into your layer stack, and start messing with any of these properties. All right, that wraps up this tutorial. If you would like this video and subscribe to our channel, that would help us out a ton. Um, if you have any suggestions or problems you've ran into in Cinema 4D that you would like us to take a stab at, let us know in the comments section below. And as always, if you're interested in any 3D models, head on over to thehappytoolbox.com. All right, I'll see you next time.